Welcome to Creative Conversations, and I'm honoured today to have Fiona Joy Hawkins join me. Hi, Fiona. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure. I've, I've been listening to your music a lot uh, lately leading up to our interview, and uh, the more I listen to it, the more I appreciate, you know, just how amazing it is. How would you actually describe your music yourself? It's more for me, it's about storytelling in a way to just put my perspective out there and sit down at the piano and put down my thoughts and emotions and feelings. And in terms of genre, I guess, I don't know, neoclassical, neoclassical piano with instrumentation and vocals, it's really hard to put a description on it. Yeah, and the interesting thing is that my music starts out as solo piano and it stands alone as solo piano. So then when I go into the recording studio and start to layer other instruments, I, I end up going in completely different directions, which I love because I like to I like to be a composer and work with other instruments and other musicians. But it is interesting that they, they all stand alone um, in that solo piano environment. Certainly when I'm on stage, I'm playing them all solo. So mm. they take on a different life when you layer other instruments into them. So were you super young when you first started or...? I was eight years old. Eight. Um, yeah, my mum was 17 when I was born and my grandmother moved in to take care of me and she bought a 100-year-old piano with her and I just fell in love with it. It's just, wow. Absolutely fell in love with it. My mum showed me the staff and stave and she said, okay, this is how it works and this is this is this note and this is the next note and, and it was like a big jigsaw puzzle and I just sat there and put it all together and I think it took me about six weeks and I learnt the first page and a half of Fur Elise and wow. they decided that maybe I should have some piano lessons. Yeah, fantastic. Wow. So it, it was a very natural thing for you uh, by the sounds yeah, of it. it. It was, but I, I have to say the thing I wanted to do most was be a composer. So when I did start having the piano lessons, I'd turn up to class with these little pieces that I'd written. And oh, wow. I remember the first one, I was I was eight years old when I wrote it, it was called Thoughts and it's in 3-4 in A minor. And I'd even written it out and I don't even know how I knew how to write it out, but yeah, wow. I, I figured that out. So my piano teacher was one of those amazing individuals who encouraged me in that direction and didn't sort of, you know, give me the wrap over the knuckles and say, you've got to do your scales and you have to do your classical training. Yeah. She encouraged me to do that so that I could get to the end result which was being able to do my own compositions what what a blessing that must have been Very having happy. a teacher like that that's yeah. perfect isn't it mm -hmm. so so you'd obviously to some degree taught yourself theory and notation I had taught myself theory but what else was interesting was that part of the the classical training is that you go to musicianship classes. I was dreadful at musicianship. I didn't like it at all. It was it was like doing maths, you know. And people say that you're supposed to be good at maths when you're a composer. I don't know how they figured that out because I'm <laughs> terrible at maths. But I, I remember going to the musicianship classes and thinking, oh, you know, this is so structured and there's so many rules and and. And I didn't enjoy musicianship at all. You know, I, I went right through all the grades and I passed, but mm. I did manage. In, in, an, in that first instance to teach myself basic notation so that I could write my own compositions. Yeah, fantastic. And then learned a lot as I went along. <laughs> yeah. So so you always had that um, motivation to create your own music from, yeah. from the get-go. Yeah, and I was one of those kids that, you know, if everyone's doing one thing, I wanted to be doing another thing because I had my own pathway, my own things that I wanted to do. Was, I was probably... I was probably difficult in some ways to teach because I had my own agenda and, you know, I just I just wanted to do what I wanted to do and and I was always going to go in my own direction. Yeah, right. So so how deeply did you go in the, you know, the, the classical lessons side of your playing? I went right through to eighth grade and I did sixth grade musicianship and I didn't really want to go any further because I figured I only needed to be able to play well enough to play what I was writing. Mm. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if you've done the AMEB exams, but they're really, really full on intense hard work, you know, mm. like there's a lot of years of practice go into getting that far. And 
I didn't want to be a teacher. I didn't want to be a concert pianist. And, and yet, in, mm. in a way, I am. But I just wanted to, to be a composer and write my own music. So to me, it seemed a little bit of a waste of time going any further. And I just kind of bailed on it. Yeah, right. I, I can relate to the um, the need to kind of develop a technical proficiency with your yes. playing because I, I, I'm i mainly self-taught, but I, I took enough full-on classical guitar lessons to give me the technique yes. and then I said thank you very much and and went on and you know I just so that, I could it's essential to a point yeah. because to learn that technique and also to learn um you know the discipline of your yeah. instrument and the theory to do all of those things you really you've got to have some sort of classical training um yeah. and yet I know people that have none at all and they've got a brilliant and amazing ear yeah. And, you know, they end up going in a different direction. And those people make much better session musicians than, than people like me that relied on the notes in front of me along the way, you know, mm. manuscript in front of me. And I had to actually learn to remove that manuscript and use my ears and play without that. Mm. So you sort of, it would be nice if they taught you these days using both both ways of teaching so that you, you're learning to read music but you're also learning to use your ear yeah yeah i can really hear in in your playing your technical proficiency but i can also hear the beautiful heart and soul that that goes into your work as well thank you i i just i mean i'm, I'm just a conceptual writer so if i've got a, a thing that i want to write about whether it's a place or an emotion or you know, a landscape somewhere that I've been, I just sit down at the piano and it's it's like having pen and paper and it's literally a way of getting it. Just sometimes it's like, like getting it off my shoulder. Sometimes it's just a way of getting something out there. Yeah. Um, and it just, yeah, it just is what it is. And if I had to sit down and write something specific, um, I probably I probably couldn't do it. You know, it's, it's, right. it comes to me or it doesn't. Right. So is it is it more about sitting down with the intention to to feel or you know write about a specific thing or place and then it kind of lands for yeah, you yeah having something that means something to me some sort of subject matter that i want to you know extrapolate into a whole album sometimes mm -hmm. one one little idea could become a whole album oh wow so yeah so then i'll sit down at the piano and i'll explore everything within that subject matter and i'll i'll you know write write an album I prefer to write an album than a single piece of music to be honest yeah right but it, it is a story and it goes down a pathway and it says so much more and, and these days we've got caught up with singles so I think it's yeah. we sell ourselves short a little bit with that yeah there's a lot to be said for the journey of an album isn't yeah, there yeah you can't write a book in a piece of single piece of music can yeah, you? you can't um, release a chapter can you oh no, you can't <laughs> yeah what does that feel like for you I'm, I'm always really curious and interested to know what it's like for other artists that that creative process and you know what does it emotionally and physically feel like for you there's pieces of music that i've written and i'll, I'll sit there and i'll tears are falling while i'm writing it you know i've really got to go to that place where the piece of music comes from and, and sometimes it's really not emotional at all it's really just you know like i wrote a piece of music called rain and you can hear the rain you can tell it's about rain yeah and and other times it's yeah it's i'm very emotionally attached mm. i i find also when you're playing live for an audience the audience can tell when you go there because you take them with you yeah, yeah. You don't go there you know, if, if there's if there's no connection to that and it's just a technical performance there's something missing um so i think yeah writing music you've really you've got to have the highs and the lows mm. in your life you know the very things that we all complain about we say i just wish my life was like this you know i just <laughs> <laughs> wish i was like everybody else and, and every day was just normal but it's not it goes like this you know, and you read a news story and you, there's tears in your eyes and something happens and it's, it affects you quite profoundly. Um, groups of people, I feel very sort of sensitive because I feel other people's pain. Mm. But that's what allows me to write music, to write stories, to dig deep, to find yeah. that emotion that I need when I'm writing music. Yeah, yeah, that, that's beautiful. I've, I always highly value any music I listen to that 
kind of stops me in my tracks emotionally, <laughs> you know, and you go, oh, yeah. I've just I've got to stop and take this in deeper, you know. Yeah, what was and that? I hear that in, in a lot of your music. I mean, you've got a lot of albums. You've been so prolific and busy. I have, I have. And the other interesting thing about what we're, we're talking about is that if you do a studio production, yeah, it's very different to a live recorded album, right. which um, is where you really get to pour your heart out and, and it is what it is. Whereas yeah. when you go into the studio, and I'll never use the word sanitise because that's, that's the wrong word, but you tend yeah. to... You make the music a little bit more palatable. You ease back on that that it, the way that you play things because somebody's in their living room or in the kitchen, they're doing something and they're listening to your music in the background. You can't jolt them in and out of the music. It's got to sit there and it's got to flow. So it's very different how you mm. record it. So when you when you go to one of my concerts, you'll get a lot more emotion, a lot mm. more emotion than what you will on the albums. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. And you've toured and performed live a lot, haven't you, over the years? I have, and I haven't done anything since COVID. Yeah, I've prob- toured probably five like... times around China and I've toured America quite a bit, a little bit in Australia, not a lot, because it's a big country mm. to cover. Yeah. So I keep saying I'll get back to it, but I haven't. I when the got... time's right, no doubt. Yeah. yeah. What 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 was the um original impetus or how did your touring career begin? I had a real drive to share my music, to get my career going because I wanted to share the music and I've always believed that everybody wants to create and leave a legacy. You know, yeah. mine, it, the only thing I really believe, apart from my children because our children are our, probably our greatest legacy, but mm. my only real gift that I have to give is my music. And, um, you know, my mum said to me, if you don't do something with your music, you you will have wasted your whole life. <laughs> and yeah. at the time I was a little bit upset with that. I thought that's a really nasty thing to say to me, but she was actually right. Yeah. And I did I did need to to just get over, get over it. And I had a problem going on stage. I was terrified. I was absolutely oh, yeah. hugely of faith for me. And it wasn't until I was, gee, I'm going to say in my early 40s that I went on the stage after, you know, because as a as a youngster learning, yeah. I had done a lot of performances, yeah. but I had family and I stopped and there was a big gap where I had no piano at all. So going back to it, I'd had a few scares earlier on, um, you know, I had a lot of nerves, a lot of things that made me quite afraid of going out in front of an audience. So I had a lot to overcome with that mm. and, um, and I figured, you know, there's only one way to do this and it's tackle it head on. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. So I did and I started touring and what I really loved with, was that you could you could go somewhere like China where you might have a 1,000 people in the audience and the yeah. first night you're terrified and then the second night you, you're still scared and the third night you're less scared and by the end, by the time you get to the 10th concert, you just walk on stage. It's <laughs> really just experience. You really yeah. just get out there and do it. I've got to get the courage now to get back to it. And I've get got to back do into it. Because yeah. being writing music is one headspace. Mm, mm. Performing is a totally different headspace and it's a lot of scales and a lot of practice and it's a completely different world. And I, I really need I need to get back to that. Because I'd imagine with grand piano, you, you have to have that proficiency physically, don't you? Because mm. it's such a wonderful beast of an instrument i mean it's huge and imposing in 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 its the scale of its sound and everything so you you kind of imagine i imagine you need good technique to you know make the most of it i guess absolutely i i just went back to playing since covid and it's been it's two and a half years and um cookie marenko blue coast records said oh fiona i've set aside a couple of days in the studio for you um, to record and, and I was going to go over with Rebecca Daniel who's an ACO violinist yeah. and I said that's great Cookie but I've got like eight weeks and I haven't played for two and a half years and I've got a couple of songs I've written but you're talking about an album and mm. just when you first start practicing I practiced six hours a day my wow. shoulders were hurting my neck was aching my back was killing me I had mm. to 
change my position at the piano all the time. My hands were aching. It was really, really hard work. It was like running a marathon when you just started walking. And yeah, right. Yeah. I couldn't. I couldn't believe it. But I didn't feel that I was back to a standard of playing until I was about five weeks of practice in. That's how mm. long you left it. And you can't do that. You've you've really got to do your practice. You got yeah. to keep going. So There's if I had no... to go on tour, I'd need quite a bit of um, lead time. Yeah, I can imagine there's there's no shortcuts. There's it's hard work. There's no shortcuts. Yeah, you just got to put the put the hours in, don't you? Yeah, you do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so when you um, uh, toured in the states as well, um, how how did that come about? That must that's a brave move. Just you know, setting off to to do that. It just starts out with somebody that really likes your music that says, when are you going to come over and play over here? And you think, nice. you know, that, that's how it starts out, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I think I learned to kind of buddy up with other musicians that would open for me, that would then help me organise something in their hometown. So I've worked with a lot of different people and there's a lot of places I could go back to. Um, mm. You know, I could organise a tour and go back to the US quite easily. But with airfares now and with visas, it's not lucrative. You, you can't really, you can't really justify doing it. Mm. Anyway. It's great that you did it when you did it. In that case, I'm waiting for an invitation from China again. Yeah, right. Excellent. <laughs> That's yeah. what I really like. Yeah, I love, yeah. I love playing in China because they've got, I think it's four, four million children learning the piano. Four million. <laughs> they all turn up to the concerts. <laughs> yeah, and they're all pretty jolly good too aren't they oh yeah you know you end up with a mosh pit of 10 year old princesses (laughs) well they're so dedicated aren't they they're just really just put they talk about put the hours in they just head down get into it i can imagine yeah it's a great place to tour because they really do love piano they turn out everything's organized for you you've just got to walk on stage and and play and that's what i really like doing oh awesome i hope that opens up again for you Mm -hmm. yes I know you've worked with a lot of incredible musicians, like some of the best globally over the years. What, how, How's that experience been for you? Because you, you're talking about, you know, you write your pieces and then yeah. that layering of other instrumentation. Such a learning curve to work with, with so many amazing musicians and so many instruments. Mm. So... Um, and the more people you work with, the less you realise that you actually know. <laughs> right, right. You know, because they, I started, like, to give you an example, I started out the first time I ever wrote for violin and cello, I turned up in the studio and I had all the up bows and the down bows and the violinist said, Fiona, never give us our up bows and our down bows. We, yeah. we work that out as we go, you know. Yeah. So I had so much, I had so much to learn. Yeah, <laughs> but I yeah. have worked with some incredible, incredible musicians and uh, I think Will Ackerman um, particularly opened that world to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, like you've mentioned also, uh, Wyndham Hill was just this incredible, um, incredible institution, I guess. It's almost yeah. a part of music itself. And, um, yeah, meeting Will Ackerman, I, f- I felt like I had a place, like I belonged somewhere in the music industry. Mm, mm. Yeah, so I've, I've mentioned it before um, mm. with Shambu just recently uh, about what a massive influence they were for me and Will in particular. George Winston, Liz Yeah. Dale. Actually, yeah. So thank you for mentioning George. I wanted to, I wanted to mention him. And um, um, was he a massive influence for you? Absolutely. Absolutely. I I've always said that I'm his biggest fan. He passed away recently, which was oh, did he? Really sad. Um, just loved his music. Loved his musical sensibility. Mm. Um, yeah, just used to listen to his music all the time, and and yet. Um, lucky for me (laughs) you Mm. you don't don't want to absorb too much of somebody else's music by listening to too much of it because you've you've got your own sort of artistic direction Mm. really did i really did love his music yeah 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 it's amazing and and you mentioned you've been working with rebecca daniel more recently becky um used to work for the australian chamber orchestra the sydney symphony orchestra 
she led the orchestra for I think it was 927 performances of Phantom. Wow, wow. Gosh. So an incredible career on the stage. And we'd worked together quite a number of times, but now we've started co-writing. Mm, nice. Doing albums together, and that's that's lovely as well. Yeah. We've got four albums that we've done together. Wow. Yeah, I've enjoyed listening to to your combined work. It's beautiful. And also I wanted to acknowledge the your beautiful vocal work. Um it, it reminds me a lot of Enya. Oh, thank you. I, I hope never... that's a comp I mean that in the best <laughs> yeah, possible way. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm I'm flattered. Thank you. I never thought of myself as a singer. I always wanted to be a singer. Yeah. But I never had any vocal training and um and here I am singing more and more and more, and I've been invited to um, sing for the Celtic World Orchestra and a few other oh. Oh, sessions wow. for people, and and which is really lovely. It's great, yeah. <laughs> and I get I get better as I go. So oh, it's you're doing a beautiful job. It's it's very hauntingly beautiful, and um, yeah, it, good on you for incorporating it because it's a it's a it's a wonderful flavour. Do you, do you have sort of uh, Celtic connections yourself, like? Where does I, that come? I did one of those DNA tests with Ancestry.com and it came back 100% Scotland and Ireland. Oh, I, well, that <laughs> my is... My grandfather ex- came from Scotland when he was eight years old. Okay. So all my families, the, he- the Heaney's, the McEwen's, the, yeah, all from Scotland and Ireland. So, oh, I nice. guess, you know, you could say I'm, I'm kind of channeling that somehow. Maybe it's in the DNA. I, I don't know, but it's definitely there because I have yeah. a real interest. In yeah, yeah. Flavor. I can kind of feel the mist swirling in, <laughs> yeah. in some of your beautiful <laughs> vocal parts. Yeah. Um, and hats off to you also from a, um, a business perspective because um, your music, you know, you've been prolific and it's uh, you've got this amazing catalog, but your your um, marketing skills uh, are to be admired as well but i figure it doesn't matter how good your music is or how much you believe in it if you don't get it out there nobody's going to hear it mm. so i've had to learn that along the way i've had to learn um to be a good business person and i've had to learn how the music industry works um, i came into the music industry with a really strong probably retail and marketing background yeah um, successful business person um i had a marketing company right right i came into the music industry with definitely with a slightly different perspective because i could sort of look at it and see what was and wasn't working and try and pick trends and sort of but there's there was a lot Mm. to learn about it and i can hardly keep up with it it's changing every five minutes you know it's Mm. Mm. it's hard to keep up with it it's a very difficult industry to make yeah. money in, as we all know. But yeah. for me, that challenge is what spurs me on. I'm actually quite... <laughs> tenacious. I'm, yeah, I'm tenacious. <laughs> I'm not going to take no for an answer. <laughs> you have to be tenacious, don't you? If it's Like like you said, it's one thing to make the music, but it's uh, also no point being the best-kept secret, is it? No, 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 no. And... and it's very hard for most artists too because we're creative. Mm. We're different side of the brain to being a marketing person. So you kind of have to learn to juggle the two hats. You have to learn when to take one hat off and put the other one on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and that's that's a hard thing because, you you know, you've, I think I mentioned this before too, you have to put yourself out there like a widget, like a can of Coke. Mm. You know, <laughs> Fiona Joe Hawkins, yeah. and Kevin Smith. This is out there, and yeah. you're back here. You're this anonymous person that's selling this product. Mm, mm. You can't do that, and you learn to do that. You get better at that as you go. But that's yeah. what because you you're putting yourself out there on social media, and none of it feels natural. No, um, no, no. It's such a dichotomy to what to the thing we enjoy the most. It is, yeah. But but nevertheless. And, and, the thing we enjoy the most should not have anything to do with financial return. And yet to survive and to be a good business person, we we have to have financial return. So how do you weigh that up? You, you've got to really, you've got to get a handle on, on who you are and where you sit and what's important to you. So you're a painter as well, I believe. 
I am actually. I am an artist. I think I'm a better musician than I am an artist. <laughs> have you painted all your life as well? Yeah, I have actually. Since I was a little girl, I used to love, um, yeah, colouring in and drawing. And <laughs> yeah, um, I loved. I've I've always loved colour particularly. So my art is very bright and very layered and very textured and um, which is quite, I don't know, I think it's different to my music, which is often very sad, but somehow or other the two seem to go together and I've done a lot of paintings with manuscript on the canvas. Um, I haven't had a lot of time to paint lately because my music took off. You can't do both. You can't do both things Mm -hmm. efficiently. You know, you can do a little bit of art and be a musician or you can do a little bit of music and be an artist. Yeah. So I can't have had to um, leave the painting. Um, yeah, it must be nice having that outlet, though, just to kind of balance your yeah. creative endeavours. Yeah, every now and again I'll go and throw a bit of paint around. and you yeah. Know, yeah. Oh, that must be amazing. My hair and all over my hands. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen. It's a very tactile thing, the way I paint. As I'm speaking to a wonderful piano player, of which I don't get to do every day, uh, I wanted to just... Also, just explore a bit more. It must be, what what's it like to kind of be immersed and bathed in such a big vibrational sound? Because, you know, my mm-hmm. guitars are, are amazing yeah. in themselves, but they're small, you know, and you've got this huge, big sound. That must be incredible. And I think the instrument that you have as a musician is really important because that's what motivates you, the sound that you, you know, when you press a note down, if you've got a keyboard, you, you're not, it's not, you're not motivated. You know, the sound's pretty ordinary. But when I press notes on that piano, it's like, wow, a whole world opens up. Mm. And I've got uh, 97 keys. So I've got the second piano that was made by Wayne Stewart. That's oh, wow. His piano. The, the second one he made. Yeah, yeah. So it was his wow. That was his prototype, one of his prototypes. So now there are 102 keys, but mine's got 97. And wow. as a composer, it just gives you um, it just gives you more to work with, I guess. You've got more notes. <laughs> yeah, and has it got more notes on either end? Yes, it does. Yeah. Yes, it's a bigger sound, and it's it's really lovely. It's really beautiful. I've got it in a regular house. It's a concert grand. Probably the room is is too small for the piano. It should be on a stage, but that's okay. Um, I love it. It's How just, long are they? Uh, it's nine foot. Nine foot. <laughs> that's a that's a big instrument, isn't it? Yeah. Do you do you find yourself? I, I I guess this is probably part of your composing process, maybe. But do you find yourself just going to it for a sound bath, and then does that maybe turn into pieces of music for you, or? It depends on what I'm writing. Sometimes it starts out with a great little rhythm. You know, I've mm. got something in my head and, it, and it, it's something almost imagined, some sort of little little rhythm that I can kind of sing in my head and then I'll sit down and I'll, I'll work on that. Sometimes it's a melody. Sometimes it's a, a, the idea of a sound bath. It just depends. Every song comes from a different a different place. Yeah. And I did used to play the guitar. Can I just say I'm not a very good guitarist? But um, I've written a lot of songs on the guitar. Oh, and nice. They come from a, I haven't recorded any. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, but you come from a completely different perspective, whether you're starting with a guitar, a piano, um, a vocal part, like a lyric. Mm. It, it, it dictates how you go about the piece of music, where you're coming from. So um, whether I'm coming from something melodic or something rhythmic or a sound bath or a lyric. Mm just a chord um, yes. it's where the piece of music goes to otherwise we'd all write the same music every time we sat down to write I guess yeah I can relate very much to the thing about you know depending on what instrument you're using it, it yeah. really uh, informs the, this kind of mood of, of what you come up with because if I'm playing electric it's it's yeah it's a chalk and it's cheese to, yeah, to class yeah. if I'm playing classical guitar it's a completely different vibe. Yeah, so you so, probably know exactly what I'm talking about. If you're going to start writing on on various guitars, whether it's electric or acoustic, or yeah, it's going to be a completely different piece of music. Mm. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Very and if you so. start writing in the right hand, it's probably going to be 
more melodic if you start writing you know and it, and, it, and it's more sort of left hand centric then it's going to be more rhythmic so yeah got to yeah. you, you got to shake it up you've got to i've got I think i've got 14 albums and as much as i probably have a defining style i'd like to think that there's some variation between all the pieces <laughs> yeah i can i can hear a lot of variation within your catalog which is not easy to do you know like for for any musician i think so good on you with that because um you know that's a ongoing challenge for any musician to kind of yeah. explore new boundaries and or push the boundaries do you have any particular things that you'd love to achieve or specific goals musically moving forward just keep working just be a viable musician that's got enough of an audience and enough of a fan base and, and enough um people that, that want more music that i can make more music i guess i just want to keep going really i just yeah well, I think your mum was right. It would have been a, um, a a real shame had you not shared your amazing gift with the I world. I kept it to myself for a long, long time because I, you know, it's like that whole thing of putting your big, big toe in the water. You know, yeah. you're scared to do it. You just, you don't know what's going. What if I fail? If this mm. dream stays in my head, it's it's almost tangible because it's there and it's whole. And, and I can revisit it and I and I haven't failed. If you get it out there and you actually give it a go and you fail, dream over, gone. Mm, mm. And I actually believe that that was the reason for my whole life and that's why I was too scared to do it. I mean, how stupid is that? Because if it's the reason for your whole life and, and you don't do it, then what's the point? So my mum mm. was actually right. And that's possibly why I'm so driven and tenacious now and why mm. I have such a prolific um, work ethic and and such a large catalogue is because I'm making up for a lot of lost time. The first time I went into the recording studio, I was 38 years old. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, ne I'm nearly 60 and I've I've just had to, felt like I've had to run a marathon mm. to, to get where I needed to be because I'd, I'd lost so much time when I'd done nothing, you know, yeah, when, I right. should, when I should have been doing something a long time before that. You've been really busy with all your uh, video production as well. You've got uh, masses of beautiful videos on YouTube. Yeah. I learned to make videos during COVID because oh, what, else, what else do you do? You know, you yeah. live stream and you, I did a course on um, music licensing, synchronisation licensing and copyright law and all that sort of stuff. And I learned to make videos. So I kept myself really busy. And it turns out I love making videos. I don't mm. know that I'm just great at it but I really really enjoy it mm, me too me to, yeah you're really good at it thank you <laughs> um, to, for so me to, oh, thanks. Uh, to discover that because I love photography and I love you know taking I love going into the wilderness like I've been to the Arctic and I've been to New yeah. Zealand National Park and to be really um to, to be able to capture the video footage and use it with music to make environmental videos just mm. suggestions to people that they might kind of think about that subject matter I, I believe that if people make an emotional connection with something you know like the fact that the ice is shrinking in the arctic and the polar bears are, are suffering if you can make people feel something they're more likely to get educated to want to know more and that's that's what starts the process so um mm. you know it's a really basic contribution, but I just want to do something so that people feel on an emotional level about some environmental issues. Yeah, well done. So amazing. There's no end to your talents. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still learning about video. I, I, I can't say it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm only using iMovie, so it's pretty basic, but it's a lot of fun and I'm it, really enjoying it. Yeah, it's a, it's a great um, medium for, yeah, expressing and uh, yeah, you put it with music and you really can tell stories it, yeah it's transformative isn't it yeah it, yeah I, I i absolutely adore that yeah it takes it from this level to kind of that level and yeah, yeah. I, I find even when i include me playing guitar people it's almost like they hear the melody i've had people say to me oh, i can hear kind of hear your guitar parts more because i'm watching you play it yeah yeah and it's like oh how interesting yeah. So 
But, it, but there's a, there's that technique too where when you're playing a guitar solo or a piano solo that mm. you actually focus in on that instrument. So mm. there's that, that auditory visual connection where people do hear that part more because you, you're giving them that, that connection. So there's so much to learn with it. I, yeah. You know, if I, if I come back again, if I get another chance, I'm going to come back <laughs> as, a, you know, either a film director or a videographer or whatever because I really enjoy that medium. Yeah, that's beautiful. I'll make sure I put um, all your links in the description of this video. Awesome. So if any, people who I've are watching. I've just got one link. I've just got one link. This oh, month. yes. Yeah, no, that's your marketing skills coming to the fore yeah. again. Yes, I'll put that <laughs> link in and there's heaps of fantastic links on there. You can explore all of uh, Fiona's amazing work. So um, thank you so much for having a chat with me today. Um, it's been wonderful to learn more about your work. And as I said before, I'm really enjoying uh, your whole catalogue and, and everything you've done. It's amazing. So congratulations on that. Any other parting thoughts that you want to share with anyone? Just that I love it when people uh, discover an instrument because because they hear you play and they say, oh, I've always wanted to learn piano and I discovered your music and now I've got the sheet music and you think, it's great that's why I do this yeah yeah, yeah. people can discover music for themselves and the power of music and what, what it can do you know for yourself I guess yeah yeah you so know you're... that I know that but there's lots of people that discover that along the way and that's that's nice to be able to help them on that journey do you um offer your your scores or your sheet music of your pieces yeah yeah, yeah. wonderful wonderful Oh, that's awesome. Well, thanks again, Fiona. And also I wanted to just thank everyone who's watching the video. Thanks for joining us for this episode. And I look forward to following your career uh, in the future as well, Fiona. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Thanks again for watching Creative Conversations. I really appreciate it. If you've enjoyed this episode, please hit the like and subscribe buttons and hit the notification bell if you'd like to know whenever new episodes land. Please share with anyone you know who would appreciate this content. If you'd like to help support the production of future episodes, I have a donate link in the video description and a link to my YouTube music channel as well. Thanks so much.